Welcome, folks. Yep, it's on. All right. You are the attendees of the very first, and I'm saying this for a reason, very first community engagement and input session of the Commission on the Future of Public Education in Vermont. Uh, my name is Megan Roy. I am the chair of the Commission, and most of the Commission is here. In a second, I'll have them introduce ourselves, themselves. Um, I want to start by saying that um, some of you have sort of um, tuned in on the screen, and so you might know some of this, and some of you are brand new, and this is the first time you're learning about it. Um, one of the things that we know as a commission is that it's really important to us to hear from as much of Vermont as we can as we do this work. And we also know that we want to be really thoughtful and mindful and planful with how we do that. And so one of the th first things we did is decide that we want a communication and engagement consultant to support the commission. We don't have that consultant yet, but we didn't want to wait and lose the opportunity to meet with people when we are traveling around. And so that is what today is all about. So we have planned a session that hopefully gives you some information about the commission's work. Asks um, most, hopefully we spend most of our time hearing from the folks in the room and having discussion amongst yourselves and as a group. We seem at the moment to be sized well enough for that. We do have some folks on the screen that we will weave in. Um, but we'll learn from how tonight goes and we will help our consultant as they come on board learn about what worked and what didn't work. Um, and so thank you for being kind of our, um, our first group. So with that, here is what we you cannot see the bottom, but we'll help you with that. Here's what we think we're gonna do today. Um, everything you see on the screen will be posted to the website um, later. So there are links in here that you can refer to. I'm gonna kind of get out of the way for this group on the side. We wanna give you a little bit of information about the purpose of the commission and kind of an overview of what we've been asked to do. We don't wanna to spend too much time on that, but we think that's important context for you. We'll give you a little bit of an overview of kind of the context for public education in Vermont, who's responsible for it, and why is it so complex right now. That includes an overview of our education finance system. And we really wanna make sure that, this is the part you can't see, but that community members are engaged about this work. And so we are not gonna stand and talk to you this entire time. After each of these sections, we'll have some discussions with the folks in the room. So first, duties of the commission. So the commission was convened by the passage of Act 183. And this is our charge. So we are charged with studying the provision of education in Vermont and making recommendations for a statewide vision for Vermont's public education system to ensure that all students are afforded substantially equal educational opportunities in an efficient, sustainable, and stable education system. There's a lot of jargon in that, but that is our charge. Our charge is to make recommendations. We do not make decisions as a commission. Our job is to research and study and make recommendations. Here's who we are. And I'm gonna ask each member, John's gonna pass the mic around. I'm Megan Roy again, I'm the chair of the commission and I am on the commission because I was the former chair of the census-based funding advisory group, which is an advisory group uh, when Vermont changed how they fund special education. Testing. There we go. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, hi, I'm Nicole Mace. I'm the representative for the Vermont School Boards Association uh, on the commission. Hi, my name is Mike Licklider. I'm the superintendent of the Harwood Unified Union School District, just north of here, and uh, I'm the representative of the Vermont Superintendents Association. Good evening, everybody. Jay Nichols, executive director of Vermont Principals Association and appoint the appointee for the VPA. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Conlon, and I am the appointee from the Vermont House. Good evening. I'm Ann Cummings. I'm the appointee from the Vermont Senate, and I chair the Finance Committee. Good evening, everybody. I'm Craig Bolio, Tax Commissioner. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Dex Samuelson. I'm the chair of the Vermont State Board of Education. Thanks for coming. 
Jeff Finn, the Executive Director of Vermont NEA and the Vermont NEA appointee to the Commission. Good evening, I'm Zoe Saunders, Interim Secretary of Education. Good evening, Oliver Olson, I'm the appointee of the Vermont Independent Schools Association. Good evening, I'm John Castle, I'm the Executive Director for the Vermont Rural Education Collaborative. Thanks everyone. We have a couple of members who were not able to join us. Um, I believe Elizabeth Jennings is a, our representative from the school, Vermont Association of School Business Officials, and that might be it. So that is the commission, and we are, you know, we talked a little bit about what this format should be, and we want to do the best we can to just kind of listen to what your conversations are. So uh, we'll be wandering around during the discussion um, and not just up at the table. So I'm gonna give a little bit of information about the duties of the commission. First, we are required to conduct at least 14 public meetings and at least one meeting of the commission or a subcommittee has to be held in each county. So um, we have held meetings at the Agency of Education in Washington County. We are here and we'll continue to rotate around the state. Um, that's Our goal is for full commission meetings to rotate around the state. Uh, it's possible that subcommittee meetings will also rotate. All of our meetings have a virtual option to attend. Um, and again, you'll hear us say this over and over. Part of the reason we're contracting with a communication consultant is so that they can help us with this. Uh, we will likely have virtual only um, options for participation forums as we continue on our work. There is some mileage reimbursement for members of the commission. Um, I think that's important to understand that, that, that uh, folks on the commission are volunteers. We are here appointed to represent um, our organization. We are responsible for submitting final recommendations for public comment by October 1st, 2025. Um, that public comment period is specified. It has to be at least 30 days. Um, the, the process must include a public outreach plan and that any feedback we get from that public input process has to be added to the final report. The substance of that report, there's three policy considerations that we have to look at. One is we need to um, make recommendations to, about our education finance system geared toward an education system that affords substantially equal access to a quality education. This is, uh, the language in this is very, is directly from the law. So we have to make recommendations about our education finance system, how we pay for education, how we raise money, how we spend money. We need to make recommendations around education governance, resources, and administration. This has to do with um, our Agency of Education, our State Board of Education, um, decision making, what decisions are made at the local level and what are made at the state level. Um, we need to integrate career and technical education into this conversation. And the Commission needs to make recommendations about the physical size and footprint of our education system. So we talk a lot about the delivery model. How do we deliver education? How many schools do we operate? How many districts do we operate? Um, there's a lot in here. Tuitioning, students who access education outside of Vermont. Um, so these are the things that we are responsible for making recommendations about. And as you can see from that list, those are really, that's a hefty charge. There's a lot in that. There's a lot that we're responsible for doing. And here's how we're required to deliver that. We needed to start our work on or before July 15th. We did that. Um, we needed to submit a work plan and communication plan. Um, we can, we'll rotate around during discussion with copies. We have a copy of our framework for how we're approaching our work, a copy of our communication framework, and a copy of our guiding principles, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, all of the things that are here are also accessible on our website. So we need to do that by September. The most important or soonest deadline that we have right now is we need to create a report with preliminary findings and recommendations, including short-term cost containment recommendations by this December, 2024. Um, so we started that conversation 
Uh, we tried to build our work plan to get us there. We had a substantive discussion today. Um, that is a very short timeline, um, but that is what we are charged to do. Our final report is due December 1st, 2025. We have the year to be able to develop that report. And that report by December 15th should include legislative language. And if this um, continues as it's meant to, this group will not exist after December 31st, 2025. I'm talking a lot, I promise that's not the goal of the rest of the evening, but I have the heftiest background knowledge part. So our commission early on um, agreed that we needed to have a set of guiding principles that would help us in our decision making. We know that these are hard things, that we are gonna make rec recommendations that are difficult for folks, that touch on things that are very, um, that require a lot of change. And in doing so, we need to understand how are we making those decisions? What are our guiding principles? And so this is what the commission agreed to. The first is an acknowledgement that in Vermont, based on our constitution, the state is responsible for education. Um, they choose to deliver that education by delegating authority to local school boards um, and districts, but that's a choice. And ultimately the responsibility and authority lies with the state. Um, we also know that there is a long tradition of local decision making in Vermont, and there's a tension between those two things. Um, so this is an acknowledgement more than it is a principle, but it's something that we uh, keep at our forefront. It's very important to the commission that we um, make decisions centering equity um, for Vermont students. Um, there's lots of ways to define equity, but we understand these uh, three core understandings. And the first one is that equity does not mean equal or same. Solutions with an ex equity focus sometimes are differentiated by need. So if a community or a town or students require more in order to receive that education, then those resources need to be distributed that way. And equity, we have to think about equity in terms of what students access and how they do. So both inputs, what they have access to, and outputs, what, what are their outcomes? How do they do as a result of that? We have a guiding principle of quality. We wanna make sure that the decisions we make maintain quality for students across the board. Um, this language, equitable, inclusive, anti-racist, culturally responsive, and anti-discriminatory, that comes from both our education quality standards and the rules that govern independent schools in Vermont. And so that is central. And the bottom bullet, again, sorry you can't see behind the chairs, but sustainability and affordability. We need to have an education system that's affordable for Vermonters. So these are our guiding principles. You do not need to read this. There is a document up here. Um, but our charge is significant, and we needed to divide it into a manageable way to approach the work. And so we have decided that there is a dedicated focus on communication and engagement. As I've said, this is the first step towards that. It will not be the only step. Um, it's really important for us to seek input from Vermonters. We are only 13 people. 13 people can't possibly represent all of the perspectives of everyone in the state. And so we need to figure out how to bring those perspectives in. So we are committed to that work. We know that we need to look at the education finance system the delivery system and governance, those are those other three levers. We need to spend time on each one of those things. So the work is chunked out, um, but we also know they all intersect. We talked a lot about that today. So um, I don't want you to try to read that, but that's how we are organizing ourselves. We have three subcommittees. The first one, the steering group, is written into the law. The steering group is made up of two representatives from the administration or nominated by the administration, two nominated by the Senate, two nominated by the House. I am a, I'm a member of that group as the chair to be able to help organize and connect the dots. We also, the steering group is charged in the law with identifying an education finance subcommittee. That's on the far right. And they, that those are the members of the finance system 
That is the only committee by law that can have an outside member. So we have one outside member on the finance committee. And the communication and engagement subcommittee, um, the commission decided to have that subcommittee so that we could focus on this. So far, this committee is responsible for organizing this session and also securing our communication consultant. And so you can see who those folks are. These are our goals. I'm not gonna read this to you. But we want, as we go out into schools, communities, as we hear from folks, we want people to have the information they need to be able to inform us appropriately. What do you all need to know about our context in Vermont to be able to give input? Um, we're gonna learn from you about what else you might need to know as part of this process. We wanna spend most of our time listening and gathering information and hearing from folks about what they believe. And this last piece is you know, partner and influence. It's, it's like one step beyond just listening is the extent to which the public has an ability to influence the decision making of the commission. That is the goal, is to plan this engagement so that we can do that. Okay, that's all that I'm gonna talk at you about. So we went back and forth a little bit about how to best facilitate this. I think that we are a manageable enough group in person, um, and we do have someone managing the, those listening in, so if they have something to say, we'll be able to pipe you in. Um, but our hope is that first, you can just take a few minutes, probably two or three minutes, to turn and talk to the people next to you, just to kind of prime. The conversation is, what are the strengths of public education in Vermont? And then after we've had a few minutes to talk amongst yourselves, we'll pass the mic and kind of ask for folks to share as a large group. So, turn and talk. All right, we have two mics, one on each side of the room, and we would love to have folks raise their hand and share some of the things that you were talking about amongst yourselves. And we'll kind of go, we'll bounce back and forth. Does anybody want to start? You can keep talking. Others might. Yes. Somebody else want to start? Some folks still would like a few more minutes, but. Uh, so one of the things we talked about in terms of the strengths of public education in Vermont is just knowing our students really well. Um, so. I think that, that that's one thing that's a positive about a smaller size. Thanks. I would say high quality um, school teachers. Uh, I would say the commitment and passion and dedication of the human capital that exists in Vermont. We talked about the strength of uh, a smaller system, and we talked about how um, you know the, our systems are smaller. Uh, but we also talked about the strength of diversity in the classroom that happens when the entire community is in uh, one one school building. We talked about the strength of uh, the community and the community connections that our schools have, that you see you know, the elementary students walking into town and you know, it, truly integrated in the community. Um, we also talked about the strength of place-based education, that we have you know, natural resources here, and, and just that I think as a state we strongly value education and I think that that's a strength here. Small class sizes. I'm coming from schools with over 30 in a classroom, and here I can have a reasonable sized class so the students can actually learn. Level of care, uh, I think that comes from the various uh, 
uh, parts of this, of the, uh, of this, not only of the state, but I think most importantly, parents, students themselves, they have voice in what they are learning. Uh, that's been a big part of how we've changed schools in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, but uh, again, the fact that we're small enough to be able to do this, uh, because we care enough about of what we're doing as educators uh, and really putting kids first. Anybody else? Thought I saw a hand. Oh, maybe that was just a wait. Someone on the screen, Maureen? Okay. We're gonna see how well we can hear. If we need to, we'll hold the mic up. Sarah, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for calling on me, even though I'm not in the room with you. Um, I think that, um, one of the biggest strengths about Vermont schools is their role in uh, town communities, especially rural schools. They're the center for so many things for communities. Often they're um, one of the biggest employers in the town, um, and um, they're also a big center for different activities. So um, they play a really important role. Thanks, Sarah. Anyone else from in the room? Sorry. All right, I think I'm turning it over. That work? So uh, John and I are going to talk about the current context. Uh, in large, it's, uh, we are guided by the 1997, 1997 decision by the Vermont Supreme Court, Brigham, uh, State versus Brigham, known as the Brigham decision. And essentially what it said is we, it, it didn't matter. I jokingly refer to this as, as elevation, right? It used to be that uh, your tax rate depended on your elevation. The higher you were in a ski town, the lower your tax rate was. And the Brigham decision said, that's not acceptable. Our Constitution says it's an obligation to provide a public education to all students. And so they, they, they decided, they didn't decide uh, how we're funding schools now. They said that the old system was unconstitutional. And they leave, left it to the legislature to create a system that would equitably fund, gives kids, all kids in the state, an equitable and equal opportunity to access the funds. And it didn't mean that uh, your school would uh, absolutely spend the same as every other school district in the state. It just meant that you have equal access. So if you raise a certain sum of money in one town, it's the same tax rate as the same as a town in another part of the state. So that's the current context. It's supposed to be uh, designed to distribute access to money equally. And, and then local school boards decide what are their needs. They look around at their student body, their community, their school system, the structures, what do they need to fund their public school system in their community? And they set the spending level. And essentially what you do is you send that budget into the state, and the state at the legislature uh, raises through tax rates statewide the funds to fund those schools throughout the state. So it's a state a locally decided decision how to fund, how much to spend on your students and then a statewide obligation to fund it. And that's the current context, and I don't know if John, you said you were gonna be unshackled and go at it, but uh, I don't know, there, there may be more to it. So do we go to another slide? Uh, so what are some of the challenges of this current delivery system, and what ideas do you have to address these? So that's the discussion topic sentence for you, the question, and we hope you'll uh, dis discuss that amongst yourselves and with others, and. Uh, Figure out what's next. Yeah, and maybe we'll give folks more time in your smaller groups because I think we've kind of moved on and I think we'll end up with plenty of time. So, um, 
front will we'll let you generate some more discussion and then we'll move to the local group. Who would like to share? <laughs> Lots of really good conversations happening. I'd love to get some of the ideas. challenges that we have right now in our education system is um, that we as a school are trying to meet many of our community social needs as well as our educational needs so we're serving as hub for mental health hub for um, our physical health hub for food service we're, we have a lot of needs that we're trying to provide in our education system Sorry, thank you. Um, so one of the, the items that we discussed in our small group here is this idea that we actually don't have just one current delivery system. We have multiple delivery systems. Um, and, and you know, I mean, we've got a scenario right now where a lot of, a significant portion of our public education tax dollars are going to private and religious schools in the state, out of the state, and out of the country. Um, and with those dollars come a different set of rules that those institutions need to follow in order to be able to receive those dollars. And so, um, you know, our hope is that the commission spends some time discussing that, um, dives into the data, um, you know, to, to try to get the data around what is the cost of our current voucher system to, you know, the public taxpayer in Vermont um, so that we can start to have an informed discussion and, and maybe lead to some decisions from there. Just two things. Um, one uh, is that I'm hopeful that the conversation finally in Vermont can be on taking on, and to coin a phrase we heard in our group, some of the third rail issues of the state of Vermont. Um, and in the previous district that I worked at, there was a situation where a elementary school is very small, uh, and there was a great idea about how to be able to consolidate that school and the families uh, of kids that were going to be directly affected by the closing of their school uh, didn't want it. And as a result, the, they're highly organized, very articulate, uh, and very passionate about kids. And we are all passionate about kids too. We're all parents, we love our kids, we're all educators, um, no question about that. Um, but the idea of having incredibly small classes, um, you know, taught by a few teachers, uh, the inequities are screaming, uh, you know, in terms of that situation. Vermont, unfortunately, have, now I've lived here since I graduated from the University of Vermont. I'm from New York City originally. Um, you know, and one of the things I love about what you've been able to accomplish with the public education system is just that. You make it of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's amazing in terms of what Vermont's been able to accomplish. Um, you know, I do not see how we can't continue to do those things with regional schools. <laughs> I think we can absolutely can do it. Um, you know, and the, the other piece I will, it, just in terms of consolidating, it will not harm uh, what folks are most concerned about. And I think that parents, including myself, need to get our arms around the idea that a consolidated school might take a few more minutes on the school bus. That's true. Um, you know, but there are much larger issues at play here, um, and the state of Vermont's commitment to local control is fantastic. I think you can have local input as opposed to local control. There's something to really consider there. Um, you know, and I'm sure plain legislators are very, legislators are very concerned about voicing that. I'm hopeful that groups like this, and who we listened to earlier this afternoon, will be able to give some voice to that, so the commission's not just taking all the heat. Uh, last piece, uh, I just want to tip my hat to the commission. Uh, you are fighting multiple front uh, battles here. Um, thank you for your courage. Um, thank you for taking this huge undertaking on. Uh, you know, this is a remarkable uh, piece that you're doing here because it's really trying to change the DNA of education in Vermont. Um, and we've done it really well for a really long time. Uh, you know, uh, but as a result, 
of that. Let's keep building on that work and just helping people understand if we can continue to create a quality experience for our kids and have our teachers be supported, but looking at it in a way that's not going to have people lose their homes. So um, staying on the topic of third rail issues for a minute, Tev and I had a long discussion about the, the real need to think about funding education not through property tax in the state of Vermont, but through income tax, which is a far more equitable way to, to ask people to contribute to the education of our, our children as a state. One other part of that discussion that we talked about was kind of the uh, the parallels between the funding crisis in education and in healthcare, um, and sort of thinking of you know Act 48 and the Brigham decision is almost being parallel in that they you know mandate and obligate the state to provide a public good and I would argue human rights both education and, and healthcare, but without really figuring out fully how, how that can be funded in an equitable way. And so as a result, I think, you know, we're, we're sort of like living in, in, in the, the limo or, or chaos of, of not having that figured out. And one just aspect of the challenge that I wanted to highlight was the way that the increasing cost of health insurance, right, which has been skyrocketing for a while, certainly since I've been paying attention to a union stuff, <laughs> I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I have to imagine that is a major driver in the cost of education and sort of thinking about what would it look like to apply the same principle of equity that we were talking about with uh, funding through income tax as well to healthcare. And I guess that's a short way of saying, how, how could we get the cost of private insurance off the books of, of school and fund our healthcare system in a publicly financed way that ensures equal access to everybody? It's, I'm not saying that's not without significant challenges, but it seems to me like that's part of the picture of, of how we really get a handle on the, on the finance situation as well. Thank you. I'd just like to add along the lines of right-sizing classrooms that it's too big of an ask to ask a librarian or an art teacher or a nurse to spread themselves over three schools. And it's also not big enough of an ask to ask me to teach AP statistics to 12 kids. Yeah, I'd just like to echo what this young lady back here started out this conversation, this phase of the conversation that the buck stops with schools for a lot of kids and families with social services that are being provided. The list goes on and on. There's a gentleman named Jamie Bolmer, B-O-L-L-M-E-R, wrote a book. It's dated now, it's probably a couple decades old, but it's called Schools Cannot Do It Alone. And he started out with a list of about 18 things that schools have taken on over the years since World War II. And of course, obviously now he's added, I like think he was up to 40 last time I heard, but. Anyways, do yourselves a favor, it's a short video, Jamie Vollmer's Blueberry Story. Google that, Jamie Vollmer was a businessman, he wanted schools to be run like businesses. And the Blueberry Story, it's about a six minute video, tells of how a teacher, he was speaking to a group of teachers at an assembly, and one teacher in the audience spun him around and now he supports public schools and doesn't want them to run like businesses. So, Jamie Walmart, Blueberry Story, check it out. I left a track for you on the floor. Um, I also just wanted to thank the commission for serving in this role. I think we've given you an impossible task, and I'm really grateful to you for your courage in taking it on and using it as an opportunity to help us understand both the challenges we face and what our opportunities are moving forward. I've been knocking an awful lot of doors, and I want you to know that we are not where we were three years ago. What I'm hearing people say is they know we have serious problems and we need to make change, and so I hope you will embrace that. 
I think there's, they will be with you if you can honor what we care about, which is our children, and you figure out how to do it in a place, in a way that doesn't mean people are afraid of losing their homes, which is what I'm hearing right now. So, so please trust them. They know what you're doing and they want good answers. Um, I think, I, I just wanna echo what was said about scale. We have to have a hard conversation about scale. There was a lot that was wrong in the PICUS report, but the PICUS report, which was issued recently, did point out that when you start to spread kids like grass seed, what you lose is scale. And when you lose scale, you lose ability to provide equitable, high quality, affordable education. They identified after school in the PICUS model, which everyone thought was so affordable. All the after school was provided through school districts because you can make good use of that facility and you can bring down the cost of that program by 30% because you don't have to keep renting or buying or building new facilities. Same thing with pre-kindergarten. If you don't do pre-kindergarten vouchers and you allow school districts to contract or provide it within house, they can bring down the cost of it by using space effectively. And the same thing is true of tuitioning. In my area, public schools can't afford to raise their class sizes because they're competing head-to-head -head for students with private schools that market themselves on the basis of class sizes of five, six, seven. They lose more dollars by losing students than they do gain by raising class sizes. We are stuck and we need your vision and your help getting through this. You also have to take very seriously this issue of cost shifts, and it's not just in healthcare, it's not just in mental health. What we are also seeing is that as districts begin to bring in-house social services, they often aren't accessing Medicaid, so we're actually leaving federal dollars on the table, which means we're backfilling with education fund. We are also moving activities that used to be historically under the WIOA, the Workforce Initiatives Act, into the education fund on school budgets. We can do those things, but if we do those things and decide that's the right way, we are also choosing unaffordability, and we have to deal with the consequences of that for Vermont. So just wanted us to be very thoughtful. And then the last comment is we really have to make sure the data is accurate, and I know that you are going to look at lots and lots of data. I appreciate that the commission has sort of thrown out the net, and I know more data will be coming in. Much of the data being used recently is not accurate. If you are using the F33 data collection, we are getting absurd results, and I know school districts, including my own, have reported this multiple times. If you put funding back to the district of origin, but you don't count all of the students, you are going to repeatedly get absurd results, like per pupil spending of $41,000. That is a systemic and pervasive error which needs to be corrected because it erodes the trust of Vermonters in our ability to do good work. So please be careful to make sure that the data you use is accurate. Thank you. Hopefully there's no feedback. one thing that our group had a chance to talk about and then one other thing that we didn't. Uh, so one thing we spoke about was um, trying to give students more ownership in their education delivery system. So for example, if you have a, two students that are in the same room and one of them is telling you that they need a smaller class size, that they need more support, that they need more hands-on stuff, they need a slower pace, they're telling you what their needs are and you know environment where they also have students where are like more academically asking you for more academic rigor a faster pace they're okay with a larger class size they want more traditional learning it's hard to meet the needs of both of those types of students in the same in environment so giving opportunities for students to get the type of learning environment they're actually seeking might help um, something we didn't get a chance to talk about was an issue that I see, which is students feeling almost a level of entitlement because of the amount of services that we are providing them and not really recognizing as students how much we are giving up or giving to them. So for example, students able to travel overseas with, at, for zero dollars. 
they don't know how much that costs. Um, students able to get all of their school supplies, they don't realize how much that costs. And so they're being given a pencil and glass, breaking it into pieces and throwing it in the trash. Or something else similar to that, like they're registered to go on this trip and then two weeks beforehand they're like, sorry, I don't feel like going. And not really recognizing how much people are giving up in order to make those things happen. I would just like to first appreciate the commission and your work. Second, I hope that the commission will address the issues around supporting the adults that are doing all of this hard work. I think that, you know, statistically, principals leave at a rate of 50% by year three and four. Um, when, te when principals leave, teachers leave. Teachers are leaving at that rate as well. And I think some of what has happened is, and you can hear it in this room, there is so much being put on everyone's plate and very little in terms of external support to the, to the adults in the room. Thank you for the opportunity to make a uh, suggestion tonight. My name is Greg Hughes, I'm from Bethel, and I'm part of the Vermont uh, a group of us that are uh, friends of Vermont Public Education. We're a grassroots group, group, grassroots group, and we're trying to remedy the problem we have here. And my suggestion is this. There are many forces influencing the cost of education in Vermont, and most of them are out of our control. However, among the things within the legislature's control is the state's schools voucher program. School vouchers have caused Vermont to move away from our constitutional commitments and our core values. Property taxes have skyrocketed because we are now funding three educational systems in Vermont. We are funding public schools, private schools, and religious schools. We have turned our school budgets into a source of funds for various private interests, and at this point, school budgets are compelled to fund programs that promote discrimination, segregation, and the misuse of public funds. Prior to 1991, Vermont tuition students needed to attend a public school or one of the traditional academies. In 1991, things changed, and the vouchers could be paid to private schools. Over time, the Vermont Voucher Program has facilitated the development of a private school system with negligible regulation, minimal oversight, and complete independence from duly elected school boards. At this point, with a declining school-age population and excess capacity in our public schools, we no longer need to spend public money to support private schools. The Vermont Voucher Program clearly needs to be revised. In 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision in a case called Carson v. Bacon. The Supreme Court held that a state need not pay funds to private schools, but once it does, it cannot exclude religious schools. In Vermont, since 1777, we've had a clause in our state constitution often called the Compelled Support Clause and it prohibits the state from providing unrestricted public funds to religious schools. The Vermont legislature is now faced with the task of reconciling Carson v. Macon with the express mandate of our state constitution. There's two options for Vermont. We can choose to ignore the compelled support clause, which is what we're doing now, and continue to make tuition payments to religious schools and private schools, or we can follow our state's constitution. It's time for Vermont to call the question regarding the Compelled Support Clause. If we recognize our constitutional mandate and not provide funds to religious schools, we would then also be precluded from funding private schools and taxpayers would be expected to support only public education. The alternative is to continue to subsidize all three education systems and there will be no tax relief in sight. The reality is that Vermont, pardon me, the reality is that if Vermont was to stop spending public money to private religious schools, it would have a profound effect on the economic viability of many public school districts. My suggestion to the Finance Subcommittee 
is that they dedicate some resources to study this and determine the impact on the cost and quality of education if we were to basically roll back the school voucher program to how it existed prior to 1991. This has a strong potential to lower our taxes and the taxpayers of Vermont deserve to see at least what the financial impact of a proposed legislation would be. Thank you for your consideration. to provide a training on Vermont's education funding system that is beyond the scope of this evening. But they are going to give a little bit of an overview. Are we good? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to spend the next uh, two hours going through about 60 power <laughs> uh, So seriously, it's Vermont's education uh, financing system is complex, and it's complex for a reason, because there, whenever you're dealing with tax policy, there is a strong correlation between equity and complexity. When things are really simple, often masks inequities, as, as the system becomes complex, um, there's a strong tendency towards greater equity within the system. Um, so we have a very complex system. We have a history of uh, changes in our education finance system over many decades. And until 2003, the shelf life of an uh, education finance system in Vermont was about 10 years. Um, it's now been about 20 years since Act 68 uh, was the law, law of the land, uh, which uh, came just a few years after Act 60. And the big thing that came out of the Brigham case was prior to Brigham, as many of you know, education was predominantly funded through local property taxes, and namely the local grant list, with state support. And what happened is the state gradually starved the system of state support. There was a property tax revolt. Um, there were lawsuits, and that gave us Brigham, which gave us Act 60, and then Act 68. Um, so under Act 68, which has been the law of the land, we have um, two grant, we've split the grant list. So we have a residential uh, property tax rate, we have a non-residential property tax rate. Non-residential property tax rate is a fixed sort of uniform rate across the state. Um, the residential tax rate is variable based on your school spending. And there's a lot of other variables, but to keep it really simple, the only thing you really need to keep in mind is your per pupil spending is really what sets your local tax rate. Um, now, these tax rates, local budget decisions are made based on the number of pupils you have. That gives you your per pupil spending, which then gives you your local tax rate. That raises revenue that goes into a big pot and gets redistributed to fund everybody's uh, budgets across the state. So it's very confusing, it's very complex because we have a shared funding system but we have individual budget decisions made at the local level that result in local uh, property tax rates. Um, and I think that's it. The only other key point I want to highlight is because of this change we made post Brigham, um, your property tax rates, while they may vary from town to town, um, the revenue that's generated uh, may vary quite dramatically from town to town because your the prop, local property wealth has really no impact. Um, and the system was designed that way for, this, uh, for the very um, specific purpose of addressing those equity concerns that came across, uh, came out about uh, with the Brigham decision. So next I'm gonna turn over to my colleague here to talk about some of our funding challenges. And just to add on to what Oliver said, one of the constructs behind the whole idea was the same equal amount of pain to raise a dollar on the tax rate for people paying their taxes. So that if I lived in a town that had lots of resources versus somebody who lived in a town that didn't have a lot of resources, it would be equalized because the state was saying we have the responsibility 
to adequately fund education for all kids. So just building off that, here are a couple things under ed finance for the cost drivers. Obviously personnel, uh, about 80% of school budgets in the state of Vermont on average have to do with uh, salaries and benefits of employees. The special education cost, if you followed uh, education since 1974, you know that we passed the special education federal law that said the federal government was gonna pay 40% of special education costs. In Vermont, I think one year we get as high as 17%. Uh, paid by the federal government, so they, that hasn't happened. And then we also have issues with facilities. There's been a lot of big studies. There's talk of the hundreds of millions of dollars it would take just to get our facilities, our current schools, up to an adequate standard. Uh, tuition, that's been mentioned already. Revenue generation and uses of the Ed Fund, or are many uses of the Ed Fund that the commission will be looking at as to whether or not those are appropriate uses for things that may be funded out of the education fund that in other states are not funded out of their education fund. The delivery model is the second thing we look at here, class and school size, district size, and infrastructure. That's where the conversations around consolidation, potentially closing schools uh, come into play. And then the governance piece is around resources and administration, decision making about school size, structure, and budget. Um, we don't have uh, local control in Vermont the way some states have it, that say the local control. We have micro local control, and that we're very, very small. And we have more school board members per capita by far than any other state in the United States. There's advantages to that. Our people are very engaged in public education. We've had a tradition of passing our budgets. There's some disadvantages to that too. I can remember when Nicole Mace was in charge of the School Boards Association, she told me one time that about 90% of school board elections, nobody ran. One person ran, nobody ran against them. There was not a, a contest. And I think that's probably still the same today. And then the last thing that you can't see here in the bottom, how local school systems choose to spend their education dollars impacts cost and quality. And that's why it's important. Not just the cost piece, but also making sure that our kids get a high quality education. Okay, this is our last round of conversations, very similar cadence of the question, but this is specific to finance. Um, so, in your same groups, what questions do you have about the finance system and what suggestions do you have about our finance system? We will take about 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes until the conversation dies down in small groups, then we will pass the mic again. Um, then we'll, we'll do a quick preview of where the commission is headed next and we will have an opportunity to kind of pass the mic one more time in case folks have something to say that wasn't related to any of the questions that we posed. All right, if you wanna wrap up your conversations, we're ready to pass the mic. Which group has the solution? <laughs> you're gonna get the mic first. Hello? Oh. Uh, I didn't talk to anybody this time. I just was jotting things down, so I apologize. But one of the things that I think you might consider is um, I've heard a lot of talk about um, getting certain non-educational things out of the education fund, but I haven't heard anybody talk about things like um, taking a second look at the common use program and uh, uh, deciding whether that really belongs in the education fund or the tax incremental finance districts um, and deciding whether that belongs in the education fund. And there, I think there are a lot of other smaller non-education related things that you, you might consider looking at. And I just wanted to also uh, give you all on the commission a, um, a couple of words of encouragement. Um, besides thank you for the work that you're doing, I'm watching every moment of it. Um, but uh, uh, I want you to remember that um, there are advantages to being small. We constantly are trying to scale down things to our size from other states or other ideas, and that's fine for policy, but um, 
there are advantages to being small. We, have, we don't have six degrees of separation. We have two, if that, degrees of separation, and we are capable of heavy lifts and, uh, uh, yeah, I just want, want you to think about um, what we do have and what we can use and where we can go thanks to our size. Thanks. Yes, um, somebody brought up uh, the question of um, funding for special education, that the federal government has mandated funding, but has never actually lived up to paying for it, and has stuck the states with this enormous debt that keeps growing and growing, and the challenges to students these days are even way beyond what they were when I was in school. And I think it's about time that the federal government do something and live up to its obligation and fund this because this would make a huge difference, not just in Vermont, but the rest of the country. This is a joke that we don't, we have enough money to fund wars all over the place, but we don't have enough money for our kids and our special needs kids, especially the, the ones who are at risk the most. I mean, come on, we can do a lot better than this and it's about time. I mean, Senator Sanders has raised this issue in the past and has gotten nowhere, but it's about time to step up to the plate and do that. And on the question of the uh, private schools, um, it should be noted too that there are four private schools in the state of Vermont that are seemingly beyond um, the realm of control by the legislature for some reason, I don't know, I don't completely understand it, but they are not um, part of the usual um, discussion. So they are exempt from any kind of, uh, they, raise, they raise more money or they have more money than anybody, and they are still getting funds from the state. And I would like uh, the commission to investigate that and see why they are still getting this incredible gift and what makes them so special where the rest of the state has to suffer because of them. Okay, thank you. So we talked a little bit about the, um, the financing um, and one of the things is the non resident household property tax in many towns actually being less than the residential. Um, and could we re you know, make them pay more and maybe decouple the private businesses, the Vermont businesses, because we don't want to chase them away, but we definitely want uh, second I ran into a woman who had to leave Woodstock because she said, we don't have second home owners, we have third and fourth home owners, um, and she couldn't afford to live there anymore. Uh, so we need to definitely take a look at that for equalizing the, the burden. Um, and then I will put a plug in again for, um, maybe not at the, the K, K5, K4, uh, level, but when we look at um, the infrastructure needs and just the demographics, not only in Vermont, but you're seeing it nationwide too, uh, figuring out how to uh, meet the needs of students um, at that higher level and staff. Um, can have a lot more opportunities for students. Uh, you can have JV teams so that uh, you can have more experiences. You can have theater programs that have enough students. You have music programs that have enough students so that you can actually have a band. Um, so I, I think we need to look at that. We need to look at our geography. It's really hard because we have that the history of our home high schools, our, our, 
But I wonder if that's looking forward in the next 20, 30 years, if that's still the same need. One of the things that was mentioned in the cost drivers section of the slideshow was personnel costs. And one of the things I mentioned in our group was the idea that that's, uh, doesn't really, it isn't, doesn't have enough detail to, to be uh, valid. I mean, the personnel costs are complicated in schools and I feel like the, the cost of student facing personnel is one thing and that's completely separate from administrative personnel. And, uh, in education system in general, I think that the administrative bloat is something that's worth talking about, especially in terms of the cost, because those employees tend to be more expensive. And I don't think that uh, I don't think that student-facing personnel should be on the chopping block at this point in the process. Maybe I'll steal it since it's close by. Um, I was wondering if there's a way to make where the money goes more transparent, and that might be in our local budget and also at the state level, like, you know, someone with a clever infographic that might, you know, help engage people in a, you know, with more knowledge, because I think people are sort of addressing this issue and, and we don't know. Um, for example, I don't know, you know, where the tax burden, like, is it increasing terribly? Like, I, I, you know, I know what's happening for myself, and it, it's not too bad, but like, I don't know, you know, what, are people losing their homes? Are people like, what, you know, where is the tax burden being increased? Where is it, you know, staying level? Like some sort of, you know, in, easily digestible information or like maybe more easily digestible information might help people be more informed about this. Um, and, and I think, uh, as much, you know, any ways that we can increase transparency, I think would be helpful. Whatever we can do to help the commission with making this an assets-based conversation and not a deficit-based conversation is huge. The ta oh, taxes, taxes, taxes are investments. Taxes are investments in the future. The same way they would be for infrastructure, the same way they would be for uh, job creation, creating home, uh, helping out developers create homes, schools are obviously investments for the future. The assets that we have in Vermont that we have been willing to invest in kids is a positive. It's not a negative. The other piece to take a look at, as some of my colleagues have mentioned, is this asset-based conversation being around and connecting it to consolidation and regional schools. We heard a lot, and I think it's great uh, that we have these conversations around the class sizes being so small or the schools being so small, and the inability to be able to uh, support extracurricular activities which drive kids. Uh, they keep, keep kids in school. Um, they get them excited about school. They create local and school spirit, um, you know, uh, as well as the fact that you have this tremendous buy-in to what you're trying to do in the classroom when kids have the opportunities to be able to participate in the chorus, be in a drama production, be allowed to be able to play the sports that they're looking to be able to do, as well as the fact that not just feel the varsity team, but have a JV uh, and a freshman team, even if, if, it's a bit, if it's able. We want all kids to um, participate after school, because this, this, those, those learning opportunities are huge. But the issues around all of this has got to be, again, an, an assets-based conversation. Whatever we can do to help the commission with that, uh, I think is, uh, is paramount to this and whatever we also can do to make recommendations that the legislature needs to have the power um, to be able to uh, negotiate 
uh, you know, uh, whether it be formulas or something along the lines of saying, okay, if your high school is X amount, you are unable to provide the following services that we want to have for kids. That's equity. If, if the kids are having, going to a small school, they're having it, it's too small, the inequities between you know, one school and any school in Chittenden County, um, you know, or the larger counties that exist in Vermont, it's not that they're always going to be able to have the same opportunities, but there, there's no way they're getting the opportunities that they could get um, if we could be able to serve more kids in a larger situation and be able to get the kids to be able to, again, benefit from an assets-based conversation around how we can be able to get our folks to get excited about education again and not be so concerned only solely with spending. We got plenty of dollars here. How can we spend them more wisely? Maybe I'll just rob this for a second. Um, there's been a lot of talk of consolidation. I'm definitely not against consolidation in, in any way, but I think it also needs to be said that for me growing up here and for my kids, one of the things I value very much about Vermont schools is how the, the school is such a tight community and it's a really unique thing um, where the teachers know all the students, the students know all the teachers, and there's just, uh, there's just a really tight network and I think that also has a lot of value that we can't forget about. Um, and I think there are definitely places we can consolidate and, and give more opportunity. But as long as we don't lose sight of what we have and that tradition that we have here that I think a lot of us value. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to the commission because this is going to be such a hard job and I appreciate how tight your timeline is. Um, we've talked a lot about consolidation and I think we can consolidate in ways that improve education for our students and a lot more listening and community engagement will need to be a really important piece of that work. I think the challenge is that there's this really substantial tension between local control, local vision for education, and local needs related to tax burden. So I'm hoping that there'll be really transparent conversation and a lot of investment in community conversations around what consolidation can look like. A really honest and transparent investigation of what our funding model can look like. Does it need to be some sort of hybrid model whereby those third and fourth homes are taxed um, they're property taxed and there's an income-based model for people who live here perhaps and I think thirdly we really do need to have a transparent investigation of funds that we pay as Vermont taxpayers into um, and where that money goes whether it's private schools whether it's schools out of the country or whether it's paving roads in various areas of our state I think we need to understand more transparently where that money is going and think deeply about where we actually want that money to go because I know for a fact that our schools are providing tremendous services to our students. I would not want any of that to change. I really appreciate the role that we play in our community in making sure that our students are healthy and well fed and able to access education in our buildings. But I think it's unfair for our State to ask our public schools to continually do more and more and more and draw the ire of the community because we're expensive. I think I would just add that consolidation doesn't have to equal closing schools. And if you allow those communities to sort of dream big about what that school could look like and what the available space inside the building could be, uh, maybe it's a doctor's office that can 
you know, charged to Medicaid. Maybe it's uh, daycare to provide the after school care. Um, whatever it is, like, I don't, I don't think it has to mean closing those small community schools. I think consolidation could just mean making a district bigger so that in my AP stats class, I can have enough kids to generate the necessary data to make my lesson work. Instead of having 12 kids, I could have my 12 kids and the five kids at Montpelier and maybe 12 more kids from Spalding all in the same class. Thank you very much for all the conversation, both the small conversation and sharing it as a whole. Um, I'm going to just very quickly share the next immediate steps of the commission. Um, obviously, you know where we're headed in terms of our, our charge, um, but here's the near future. We want to continue to have these conversations. We want to get better at these conversations, um, although I really appreciate how, how tonight went. Um, we know we want to do that both um, in person, we want to do that online. We know we had a lot of folks dropping in and listening to the conversation, which I really appreciate. Um, and it is really difficult to do that well in both formats, so we want to make sure that we have some online only um, forums. We want an input tool for people that can't come out, and can't come log in, or don't want to, or have other ways to engage. So um, we really want to continue to work on that. Um, we know we are going to refine our work plan. Right now, we are really focused on that December preliminary report um, so that we can give the General Assembly um, some information. And that's what that last bullet is that you all can't see, but that, that preliminary uh, cost containment recommendations. So that's our work. Um, we do have a few more minutes. We wanted to surface conversations about those three sets of questions, and we feel like we got a really rich, um, you know, set of perspectives, but we also want to give folks the opportunity to share something that didn't fit into any one of them. So um, with our last few minutes, that's really that's really what we have. Oh, I see one hand, perfect. I just have a question. I know the Agency of Education is going around doing their listening tour. How does that fit with what you guys are doing? Perfect, thank you. And uh, I'll start, but Zoe, you can weigh in. Um, the commission was convened by the General Assembly with the charge that we talked about today, and in many ways, this was um, put on the table before the, the agency was kind of building its plan. And so we know as a commission, on the commission side of things, and I, I let Zoe talk about the agency side, we also benefit from the information that we are going to get from other work that's already happening. We don't have enough time, even if we do as, kind of yeoman's work on communication and engagement. We're not going to be able to get to everyone. So there's lots of work happening in the state, and we want to benefit from that and see it as, as information, as data and perspective. And one of those things is we'll learn a lot from what the agency is working on. It is both se it is separate. It, it's because you know it's really important work that the agency is doing for them. Um, and we will benefit from that. And we also have our own separate charge. And we kind of recognize, especially in the early going, it's a little clunky. So I'll let Zoe weigh in. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the question. Um, so the Agency of Education is excited to engage with the field on this Listen and Learn tour. We um, were looking to start the process actually last um, spring, um, but because of the time, we didn't feel like it was the right time to really engage educators. And so we've been working really intentionally to develop a planning process and try to align that with the commission to create synergy where we can. Um, it is a separate body of work and then the Listen and Learn Tour is helping us to develop the agency's strategic plan to ensure we can align our support, resources, and initiatives to meet the needs of um, the educational priorities of, of communities across Vermont. We recognize that through that planning process, there's a lot of ideas that will bubble up that will be helpful and informative to the commission. And we've committed to being really um, collaborative in that work um, and sharing that information to also support the commission's broader um, uh, 
charge of developing more of the systemic um, changes for the state as we think about the future of public education. Um, so they're related, um, but um, we are really working very intentionally to move forward and be very coordinated with how we do communication and messaging in the field. Questions too, I forgot to prompt that. If, if you have questions, happy to answer. So, uh, Mike Clark, new superintendent, 115 or so days in right now. So the first thing I wanted to do before I kind of get the sense that we're wrapping up here, I wanted to thank all of the community for coming out. It's great to hear the perspective that the community brings and important to the commission. You all have been here for a long time today. Like many of them got here at like 1230 this afternoon, maybe even sooner than that really appreciate the hard work and the thoughtfulness that you have going on. Uh, as I mentioned when I joined your meeting earlier today, I'm excited about the work that you're doing around a vision for Vermont education and making sure that we are aiming for a target that is in the future, not looking back necessarily as towards what our target needs to be. Um, I think you've heard what I've heard from people tonight is that vision's going to have to look a little bit, three big areas that I want to highlight for you. It's going to have to look at the facilities. You happen to be in the facility in the state of Vermont that the Buenos Aires, I think that's what it was, uh, study has identified as the building that is in most need of replacement in the state. It's about $200 million, give or take, to uh, replace it. And I think we're probably not super unique and we are probably not the only building in Vermont that needs to be replaced. How many of those uh, buildings, when Jay talked about hundreds of millions, I think we actually need to start using the word billion. Five of these, five of these buildings is a billion. So, uh, <clears throat> the staffing. We talk about, we talk about small class sizes and whatnot. You know, really I've said it to, I think I said it to Rebecca at one point that I wasn't worried about people passing budgets. I think they'll pass. I said it to Secretary French. I said it to Joy. I think I said it to you, right? I think that the budgets will keep passing. My real concern is that from a staffing standpoint, we can't continue to staff. Uh, right now, the Orange Southwest School District has about 20 people on provisional license, 20 professional staff members on a provisional license, about 120 professional staff members. I think if you do the math, that tells you that about 17% of our teaching population has not finished a teacher prep program. They're two years away from that. So yes, we have small class sizes, and we have people who are very dedicated. There's many of our faculty and staff out here today, and I'm proud of them. I'm proud of the people on the provisional licenses. I'd also like to see a system where we had that training be able to happen before we needed those folks in the classroom. Make no mistake, we could not have opened this year without those 20 people, right? So we need them, we appreciate it, and it's hard work that they're doing. They're teaching a full-time load and learning to be teachers at the same time. And finally, you've heard it in multiple ways today, the mental health crisis that is in Vermont. Uh, and you've heard it right here in this, this auditorium tonight where you had uh, faculty and staff talk about, we are the mental health hub, we are the regular health hub, we have washing machines in all of our schools and we do laundry for families, you know? When you think about the, the story of the blueberry, I don't know, I didn't quite get it here. I gotta get it in my, in my notes, but we've taken on a lot as education systems. Things that really aren't educational, except how does a student with a toothache that's not getting treated somewhere else, how can they be successful? How can they be successful if their mental health isn't where it needs to be? If they're walking around in dirty clothes, people don't want to be around them. 
you know so that's what we're up against and as a commission i hope that appreciate that you come out and you hear those stories and you know that what you're talking about whatever you come up with for a vision there's always going to be people out there that are going to say no you didn't get it you missed this you missed that but what i'll tell you is right now it will be a more complete vision than what we've operated in Vermont for at least the last, I don't know, 10-ish years. So I appreciate the work you're doing. I appreciate the time you're volunteering, and I won't take any more of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And that reminds me that um, I neglected to add, let Superintendent Clark welcome you here this morning. And so and this morning, we've been here a while. <laughs> The beginning of this evening so um, I also just want to extend a, a thank you to Superintendent Clark students at the Career Center who fed us today um, we have occupied two of your spaces uh, used your technology your staff has been wonderful your students have been wonderful and, and you uh, were willing to be the first hosts and guinea pigs so we really appreciate that um, For everyone, to everyone for coming out and for those on the screen. Um, commission members are here if, if people have burning questions. Um, and give us your thoughts, give us your feedback. Uh, you can, when you, the agency website has my email address, which is probably the most efficient way to say, hey, think about doing it this way next time. So we welcome your input. Thanks, everyone.